Malcolm Louie here. Welcome to Eversprint.com. Today we're speaking with Ryan Payne, the president and co-founder of Payne Capital Management, a fast-growing registered investment advisor that provides fee-based financial services for high-wealth clients. Welcome to the call, Ryan. Malcolm, thanks for having me. When you won your second Inc. 5000 ranking last year, you grew your company's revenue 71% from about $2.7 million to $4.7 million over the prior three years. Can you share how you did this? Um, yeah, wow, it's surprising to me to hear those numbers too, so I sound good. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think the big thing for us is really shifting from, you know, we, we started as a business that did a lot of our business from word of mouth um, referrals. You know, we have a very high level service model, which can only take you so far, is what I found. You know, you, there's only so many people that are going to refer you for doing a great job in any, you know, one period of time. And you don't have as much control over when people refer business to you. So what we actively start to do is, is more active, proactive marketing and spending, spending some money on marketing too. You know, the old saying, if you want to make money, you need to spend money to make money. Um, and we got very, very focused on mass marketing, which we had never done before. And, and one of the bigger successes for us was to do radio. Uh, so we actually are on in New York City and Philadelphia some, you know, uh, some of the bigger AM radio stations, which is not very cheap for the airtime, uh, but that's proved to be a very, very successful business model for us and a way to get our message out to a much broader audience of people that aren't already in our network. Um, and I think that's one of the bigger reasons, uh, you know, why we were able to scale up so much over that time frame is just moving from a referral type model to grow our business to more actively looking at mass marketing and, and marketing in general, just any sort of kind of marketing campaign that we can do where we can get to people that we don't really know right now. So radio is not a dead marketing channel, as some people would say. It's hard to believe. Radio is not dead. Um, in fact, it's a very active place for people that are 50 and above and actually, uh, I would say, more higher net worth or the mass affluent in that million to $10 million range, um, which is very surprising in the day of digital marketing. Radio is still alive and well, believe it or not. Interesting. Now, is this a strategy that you just started with right away, or did you experiment with some other channels first before finding that radio worked, and then you scaled it up on the radio side? That's a good question. My, my philosophy is always dip your toes in the water. Don't go full boat with the strategy uh, if you don't know it works. So we started the radio st strategy on a much smaller station to begin with, which was a much lower cost for the airtime, um, which was, I'd say, mild, mildly successful. Um, and then we start to leverage up from there. When we start to see some success on a smaller scale, we started spending bigger dollars for those bigger air time, you know, for those more uh, prominent air times where we really got our message out there. But we really were able to tweak it on a, on a smaller scale initially when we did radio. And I think with any marketing campaign, the biggest lesson I've learned is we've thrown a lot of money at things where it didn't work because it wasn't tested ahead of time. So I think, you know, definitely dipping your toes in the water on a small scale to see if it actually works is a really important lesson that I've learned over the years. Great. How are you tracking the ROI from your radio ad campaigns? Uh, you know, for us, it's about the assets that we manage. So we just tally up at the end of the year how much in terms of assets under management came from radio and how much do we spend on radio. And we look at the revenue we generate from those assets that we're managing. And that's how we get an idea about, essentially, how successful our radio campaign has been or not. Okay, great. Can you share what sort of ROI numbers you've been getting from the radio ad campaigns? Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a show, not an ad. Well, I guess it's kind of an ad in the sense that it's a show that advertises what we do. Okay. Um, but, but essentially, just to make that distinction. But essentially, yeah, I mean, I would say that if, if radio would cost us, um, a half a million dollars a year, you know, we probably see revenue, you know, somewhere in that range, probably a little bit less coming in a year, but the, the, the revenue is recurring. So it doesn't have to come in exactly with the same amount that we spend on the marketing, marketing because you pay the marketing expense once, but once we have a client come on board, you know, that's a recurring revenue stream. So I'd say it's not, not exactly on par with what we put out each year with the new revenue we're generating, but because the re revenue is generated over, you know, ideally many, many years, 
um, you know, we look at that as a good return on an investment, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Sounds fantastic. I mean, given that your client retention rate, I imagine, is 90% plus, maybe even 95% plus. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd say 95% plus for the record. So yeah. we're very proud of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the lifetime value of a client versus the investment you made to acquire them is fantastic. You're a huge ROI. Yes, in our business it is. I mean, if you if you have a good relationship with your clients and you service them well, I, you know, I say it's, it's like having a garden. Day. If you tend it, it's going to be very good to you. Um, if you take the time on the service side to really take care of people, it's it's amazing that uh, you know longevity you have with relationships, which is a cool yeah. part of our business. So when you say that you're you're spending roughly five hundred thousand a year for your radio show, and it's generating revenue of five hundred thousand a year. Did that happen right at the very beginning, or did that five hundred thousand a year revenue build up over time? Uh, no, right. It definitely didn't happen in the beginning. Um, it certainly didn't. It, you know, in the beginning, you. Ha I think the thing with anything marketing related, and you can probably attest to this, it always takes longer than you think. <laughs> you know, it's like I remember thinking I had this great idea with doing the radio. I'll obviously, be on the radio, and people are just going to come in droves. It doesn't really work that way. Um, I think you have to be even willing to to lose money for a year or two if you're starting to see some traction, you know, where it actually is starting to work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always go with the mindset, you know, however long you think it's going to take and how successful it's going to be, times it by two. Right. Now, you didn't start off spending 500000 a year of the radio show. You started on a much smaller scale and then you scaled it up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So initially, we, again, going with a, with a less prominent time with a maybe a lower you know, a station that's not as popular per se, our, our costs were a lot lower, but it wasn't as successful either. But at least we saw some success that gives the confidence to say, hey, you know what? You know, because there's also economies of scale. You know, for incremental, incrementally more money, um, you know, you can get on a better time, but when you look at the cost per lead or however you want to look at it, um, it's much less per lead when you're on a better station paying more money but essentially you have to have that more money to pay so you can get to those, those better times and get to a better ROI. So initially you paid less, but the quality was less and probably per lead it was less, if that right. makes sense, in terms of what you were getting. So how are you tracking the leads that are generated from the show? You're, you're, you're making uh, offers to visit your website, special link, and having them sign up at that point, and then you know it's coming from the radio show, or do you have other ways of doing it? We just offer a complimentary re financial review. Um, so... Each week we allot X amount of reviews that we'll do at no cost if you call in. Okay. So that's essentially how uh, people get to know about us. We also will give them the opportunity to download a video series, something that's maybe a lower ask to get to know who the firm is and get comfortable with us. Uh, but essentially it's through our offer for doing a, a no cost financial review up front is the way that uh, people essentially come in the door and get to know who we are and what we can do for them. Okay, and when you do talk to them, that's when you ask them how they found you, how they heard of you. You'll say, "I heard it. I, I heard of this through the radio show." Or do you have a special phone number that people are calling that's only used on the radio show, or special links on your website that's also tied to your radio show? It's very immediate. So we say, you know, it's essentially if you call in the next ten minutes and you call an eight hundred number, um, you can call for the review. And at that time, you know, we have, we have advisors that will follow up and give you a call because it goes to a voicemail initially. So we know it's directly from the radio. We know exactly, you know, what time they came in because they heard what offer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with radio, it's pretty easy to track, which I like about it. Yep. So the results are very tangible, whereas with a lot of marketing, obviously that's not the case. So, um, you know, with this type of marketing, it's very, very clear. You know, when the offer comes in for people to call, um, and essentially from there that we will have them in our database if they don't show up for the meeting or you know, if it's not the right time, we have that, that, you know, that's essentially how we build out our, our, our list of potential customers for our firm. Cool. Now, your radio show, it's only broadcast locally around your offices, you're around your greater metropolitan area where you're located, or is it a, a national sort of radio show? I mean, sadly, for all listeners across America, they don't, not everyone can hear our show. We can on the web. No, but we are, we're in the New York City market, in the Philadelphia market. We have offices in both those places. And New York is a pretty vast market, which is kind of nice. But, I mean, ideally at some point, sure, it would be great to be, uh, be national as well. But we are not at this time. 
Okay. So if uh, people want to check out your show, what station is it on and, and at what times can they hear it? Um, if you're in the New York area, it's on WABC, and that's, uh, it, it airs on Fridays at uh, 9 o'clock, I have to think about this, and Saturdays again at 12 o'clock. And if you go to bbush.com, you can actually get the show, and you can subscribe and get the show right to your email or listen to it right over the web. Okay, cool. I'm going to check that out. So for the, the radio show that you do, do you do it all in-house, or have you hired a team, an, an external team, to help you produce it and create the content and manage everything? We initially started where we had another group do, uh, create the content, uh, essentially, and then we would have a plug during the show. We've since then do our own show 100%. We have an outside producer who puts it all together, but we create the content every week, and it's an hour-long show, so you know every Sunday... I sit down and I just come up with content for the week ahead. And then my father and I, who own the business, 50-50 Partners, we, uh, we do the show together during the week. Um, we record it on a Thursday, and then it airs throughout the weekend. So it's, uh, it's become quite a production from what we did initially. And again, okay. so dipping your toe in the water and then really getting embracing it, right? That's yeah. how we do things. So each show is one hour long per week. How many hours uh, do you and your dad spend uh, – doing what you need to do to get the show up and running and ready to go? I think collectively it's probably about three to four hours because I put all the content together on a Sunday. Um, we record the show. It takes about an hour during the week. And then Bob, my partner, my father, he does the market commentary every Friday after everything's transpired in the market for the week. You know, you have to wait till the end of the week to so you know what happened. Right. Um, and that's, that's probably about an hour prep time for him to get that done. So, you know, I'd say give or take, it's about three hours plus, probably realistically it takes us to put the whole show together. Cool. And are you able to do this all, you know, in your office with the equipment you have, or, you, or does it require you to go to a studio somewhere and get it done? Yes, yeah, so we do it virtually. We're not in the same location, so I have um, equipment here in the office, and then Bob does it from, you know, he's, he's in New Jersey in the summertime, Florida in the wintertime, so he does it out of his home office. So we essentially get linked up online, and we do the show virtually together, if that makes sense. Yep. Uh, but all the equipment we do, is, it's pretty basically in-house. We have everything set up right here, which is great. Yeah, it's fantastic how technology allows people to do that now. It's just a huge time saver not having to travel to a studio and a huge money saver not, not having to rent a studio. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it definitely that's using technology to your advantage for sure. Yeah. Can you can you share a little bit about your conversion process? You have people uh, who listen to your show, they hear the offer, they get a free consultation, free uh, analysis of the current situation. You know, they call the number, they schedule a call. Um, I mean, so two questions: What happens? How do you follow up with people who don't show up at the scheduled time, and how do you follow up with the people who, after they go through your process and they decide that that that, that now is not the right time to move forward with the plan you might create for them? What's your follow-up process for both of those people? Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. So basically, you know, if someone calls in, they want to review, we put them right in our database. Uh, they're put on the calendar if they have to cancel or they don't show up. Um, we send them a really nasty email. No, I'm just kidding. That <laughs> joke. No, <laughs> yeah. you know, we try to follow up and get them on the calendar. You know, I, we have uh, the advisor, whoever booked the, the meeting, does their thorough follow-up over a couple weeks. But if they just fall off the face of the earth, they're just on our our email campaign from there, where essentially they get, you know, we have our market commentary comes out each week. We do a lot of videos. We call them money minutes each week where we just give helpful financial tips. Um, and then essentially if they do come into the office, it's really a two meeting process where during the first meeting, it's really discovery. We learn a little bit about them, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do. I mean, our whole process is goal oriented. So it's really trying to help people get from point A to point B. So really trying to understand what they're trying to do. And then what we'll do is we'll do a full analysis of their portfolio. We'll look at all the fees they're paying, uh, what risks they have in their portfolio, what kind of income it generates. And then they'll come back in and we'll walk them through a whole plan we'll put together based on what their goals are. And then we'll analyze their portfolio to say, hey, you know, either you're doing everything right or here are the tweaks we would recommend that you make to get better on track to get to your goals. And then people from there can decide if, you know, they, hey, this is what I want to do, this is what I was looking for or not. So it's a no-obligation review, but I think it's very powerful. And one of the successes of our firm, too, is just that we do everything from a really planning-intensive approach. You know, two of my advisors are 
certified financial planners. We are a fiduciary. So we do a lot of things on the planning side that I think really differentiate what we do versus just your typical brokerage firm per se. Right. Now your radio show and the process you outline is uh, that's more geared toward your uh, potential individual high net worth clients. For your corporate clients, you have a different process? Uh, well, I, I guess I would define the differences. I and mean, we, we really work with individuals, helping them get to their goals. Okay. But we also, on the corporate side per se, I think is we do a lot of retirement plans for businesses. Um, you know, we found, especially if we're working with business owners, there's a lot of ways that you can customize the plan for you to save more money pre-tax than a traditional 401k plan. Also, just pricing them out. A lot of retirement plans are extremely expensive. And there's a lot of hidden costs in these plans. So because we're an independent advisor, what we'll do is we'll go out and shop and help a, you know, a business owner or a corporate executive who, who runs a plan. You know, we'll, we'll help them find better options or reduce the cost on the plan uh, because that's one of the big things that I find is a lot of these plans have been in place for a long time. And a lot of times they're run through insurance companies and things like that. And they have a lot of hidden costs in there. So you know, reducing costs on plans has been a really important part of our business the last couple of years as well. Okay. So you know, when you grew your, your business uh, you know, 70% over the span of three years, um, was it, would you say it was primarily driven by the radio show that did it for you? Or is it also by the uh, follow-up systems that you put in place? Or was it, or was it perhaps how you've uh, adjusted and fine-tuned your services as you had, dis- had you, as you had described to me just now to better meet what people were looking for? Uh, it's a good question. I, I think it's a combination of all three, but I definitely think, you know, I think we already had great processes in place. Um, we've really been fine-tuning those year after year, which is great too. But I, I do think the game changer is still the marketing. You know, I go back to doing things like radio. Um, there's some other things that we do digitally that I've been working to. We're on a couple different platforms as a recommended advisor. But I think just proactively going out and mass marketing as opposed to just warm marketing through people that like our services and continue to use us and refer us is, is the reason why our revenue jumped at such an astronomical level. Right. What other platforms, marketing channels, did you try before you landed on radio that just didn't work out? <laughs> Man, the list is too long <laughs> to, uh, to think about. Um, we, we've tried a lot of different things. I mean, we, we hired a social media firm for a large sum of money to, to help with our web presence, which we saw zero return of investment from. Um, what else did we try that was not successful? Yeah, different services that like promised that they would deliver leads to you for X amount of dollars a month. You know, just different little, you know, I, I'm always willing to try something, <laughs> which is right. probably good and bad. Sometimes it's like we had to bring the marketing budget down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, radio hasn't worked everywhere. You know, it's been more successful in some markets and not as successful in other markets. So finding the right time, finding the right market for it too has been critical also. Um, so that, you know, we definitely have definitely had to fine tune that as well. But I'd say the online strategies are trickier for sure. Okay. The traditional strategies have worked better for us than the ones that, uh, that are maybe more, I would say new media per se. Yep. Have you tried Facebook? Because, you know, I'm on Facebook and I see the Fisher Investments hitting me up with their, <laughs> their posts and their ads on a regular basis. So, you know, I took a look at them. They're spending, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every month on, on pay-per-click ads. So I assume that it's working for them. Is that something you looked into yourself? Facebook ads I don't know, pay-per-click but, ads? Yeah. We, try, we have tried it and we use a lot of the same methods. In fact, I think Fisher stole one of our newest ideas, but that's another story altogether. They basically took the same name and everything, but, but I don't know if that's been that successful for them as well. I mean, he's a mass marketer. He's probably the 100-pound gorilla in our space. I mean, yeah. he's really successful, but he does television. You know, he, they market through a lot of different channels, so I'm not sure if their ROI on digital has been great or not because right. they market through so many different channels, and they have the money for it, um, but that's because they're great marketers. I mean, Fisher's the perfect example of someone who I would say, you know, from a service product side of things, I don't think they're the greatest, which, you know, not, I don't think they're, they're not doing the intensive kind of financial planning that we're probably doing, but their marketing is just so much better that they're, and they've been around a lot longer too, yeah. that they're so much bigger. And I bet you, I would test that to just, he is a great marketer. And I don't know necessarily though, if it's the digital marketing is where their success is. Right. 
yeah, they uh, they do that. They do have their fingers in a lot of different pots there, and also what what they have right because they're so big, you know, a multi-billion dollars worth of AUM, right? They have the cash flow to support doing marketing across many different channels simultaneously. That's right. Yeah, which and then believe me, I think about that all the time. Is every time we grow, I'm allotting more money to marketing, which because I you know I you know it's, it's exciting and I and I really like that part of the business. Um, but you know it is hard because it's like you know you gotta you gotta make sure you have your profit margins as well. So it's always a arm wrestling contest because I think once you really get into the marketing side and you see some success with it, you're always thinking about what else can you do from a marketing side. Um, and of course, your budget is never uh, in line with what you'd like to do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. What 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 other marketing ideas look promising to you that you're keen on testing out? Um, that's a good question. So, well, we do, we do a lot of TV, which has been, that's, I think it's, that's starting to pay some dividends as well. Um, we are, we're on CNBC, Fox, business news and places like that. Um, and I think just as a credibility for our firm, that's been a big deal because we're, we're probably myself or one of my other advisors is on TV now, like once a week. So I think from the pain capital branding standpoint, that's been a great avenue to get our name out there and give us credibility. So I want to keep expanding that. I think that's, a really exciting place to be. And I mean, we really have a lot of hope for the digital side. We just haven't been that successful yet. I mean, again, we do, I mentioned we do these videos every week, which I think are actually becoming really good. We do them very high end um, with just different tips. Uh, we do a lot of tutorials and things for people on how to build a budget. So I, you know, I'm excited about the web. I just don't feel like that we have mastered capturing the market on the web. And I don't think a lot of financial advisors have. You know, I, I don't know how successful I'm sure somebody out there is killing it, um, but I haven't found that magic formula, formula yet for, for the web. Right. Yeah, I've spoken to a number of uh, registered investment advisors, right, from my former background uh, in the investment banking side. And for yeah. them, marketing was always a challenge because they're always fearful of maybe going a little bit too far in the marketing and, and having the various uh, regulatory bodies come down on them. How are you juggling that? Um, I think we just... I think we're just careful in what we say. I don't think we offer anything, you know, on, from a marketing perspective that gets too into detail because I think that's where you can get into trouble, right, when you start talking about real returns and, and things like that. So I think if you keep your message broad and you're giving people practical tips, you're never really crossing that line. And I think also just inherently people that are in my business are terrible marketers and they don't like to market. <laughs> so right. they might just use me as an excuse. I mean, I think we've been able to exploit – things like radio so well, it's because just people in our space don't market. So just the fact we're doing something is about like 10,000 feet above what most people are doing because they just, you know, they're, they're not necessarily that, they're not marketing minded, which I think is a big mistake. Right. Now I take it that capacity, uh, the people you have on board can handle more business. Because some of the registered investment advisors I spoke with said they just can't even handle more business. They're like referring people to their competitor down the street, literally, because they just can't take on more people. Uh, have you had that problem, and how did you solve it? Um, yeah, once the business really started to grow rapidly, uh, again, with things like radio and other things that we've been doing, just to, that you saw our revenue expanded so much, um, I just came to the point where I realized that, you know, I'm probably more of an entrepreneur or business owner. Uh, than a financial advisor per se. So I still do the financial advising to some extent, but I have a whole team of financial advisors that we have here at Penn Capital, and they, we train them right in-house. Most come right through our internship program. So, you know, they do business the way that we want to do business because we have a real belief about how we run things. Um, and that's worked out really, really well. So yeah, at this point now, we just have a team of advisors, and that keeps growing as the business grows. And, you know, we've got a great system of, communal learning where um, the younger advisors learn from the other advisors and we do a lot of what I call mastermind groups where we get together in groups and we talk about solutions and it's, it's really become a collective in terms of uh, the knowledge base and the training for all our advisors, which I'm really proud of. I think that's worked really well. Yeah, it sounds like it. And now you have a system where you have interns from the local universities uh, working for you on the investment side, and then those are the people that you're essentially having a, a nice, long, drawn-out interview process, and then you make offers to them if, they, if you feel they're the right fit upon their graduating and being ready to work full-time. Is that how, that, how that, that process works for you to find new people? 
That's worked really well for us. Yeah, we've had the internship program, because if someone's an intern, you get a real good feel for what their work ethic's like, right? what they're like as people. Um, and I'd say that 90% of our, adv our advisors have come, or 80, maybe 80%. I know there's two people I think we hired that were not from our internship program. Um, but that has been a tremendous uh, advantage for us. That's worked really well. So I, I, I'm a big believer in interns. Pay your interns as well. I don't believe in free internships. Right. You get bad quality when you do that. Um, and yes, that's, that's essentially how we basically have filled out almost every position in our firm, which is kind of crazy. Uh, cool. And most of my advisors are millennials, which is completely against the, the trend, and women. So it's, uh, it's not your typical financial advisory firm in terms of demographics. Now, how has that been helpful in growing your business, having this uh, non-typical mix of people on your team? I think it's been really advantageous because, well, two things. Number one, you know, there's going to be a real shortage of financial advisors. Uh, there's many years where firms just weren't hiring. So you have an aging industry in general. Um, so you have a lot of people that are going to be retiring in this business over the next couple of years. So from a longevity standpoint, I think it's, it's a huge advantage. And I just think that young people um, are very good at picking things up quickly, uh, especially with technology and everything else you need to have at your fingertips today. And I think, you know, they, they, I think you have to realize they can learn on their feet fast. And anything you think you know and you're really good at, people can copy you and do it better than you eventually. So put your pride aside. You know, young people have the, have the ability and the skill set to get there. And I found with women specifically, they're very organized at a young age, maybe more so than men. Um, I know I was much more disorganized when I was in my early 20s. Um, and when it comes to planning, you know, that organization and having that discipline are really critical. So I found that women specifically make very, very good financial advisors. And it's kind of ironic that they're, you know, we don't see a lot in the industry. I think that's going to change a lot the next couple of years. What other changes in, are you seeing in, in the industry that's coming in? And what are your plans to take advantage of those tr of those trends? Either uh, ride with the trend, or if it's an adverse trend, getting <laughs> out of the way. That's right. That's right. You want to ride the right trends, right? Yeah. I, 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 the big one that I see, and I think I'm excited about, is millennials. I, I see are starting to get very excited about investing. You know, millennials have saved a lot of money the last couple of years. Um, they're starting families now. They're starting to get interested in financial security. And, you know, it's it just grassroots. We're getting a lot of millennials coming to the office asking for advice, a lot, of, a lot, of like, a lot of like their parents did 20 years ago uh, when the baby boomers were really starting the, the family formation and things like that. So it's just cool to see a new generation invest, uh, embracing investing because I think for a little while there, after 2008, when we had the, the market meltdown and things like that, I think there was a shying away from Wall Street and investing in stocks and bonds and, you know, more traditional investments. And I kind of see that coming back. Like, you know, it became unpopular, now it's becoming popular again. And I think it's cool to see a whole generation now embracing uh, the markets. And, it's, you know, it's a great, great place to create wealth, and it's nice to see the young generation now taking part of it. Right. And you have a team of millennials as financial advisors, and that's got to be you know, a huge plus when it comes to, you know, building, uh, building rapport with your potential clients. The thought crossed my mind, Malcolm. <laughs> yeah, it's a good strategy. All right, I re really appreciate the time you spent sharing with me your insights about how you grew your business. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Uh, no problem. Uh, for those individuals who would like to work with you and your firm, what's the best way for them to contact you? Should they visit you at your website? paynecm.com, spelled P like Peter, A-Y-N-E-C-M.com. Is that the best way to reach your team? Perfect. Yep, go right to the website there. You can get plenty of information about our firm right there off the website. Uh, that's a great way to get connected with us. All right, awesome. Again, great talking to you. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Malcolm. Real pleasure. We've been speaking with Ryan Payne, the president and co-founder of Payne Capital Management, about his company's rapid growth. For interviews with other fast-growing companies, or to learn how we can increase your firm's high-ticket sales through automation, visit Eversprint.com.